ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Gerard Allen. It's 2014, eight years ago. I'm finishing my master's degree in education. I'm working at my first school and I'm driving a brand new 2014 Chevy Malibu. Just leaving work, headed to my final symposium, meeting with my professors, nervous, not knowing I'm past, but still hoping that I'm prepared. Out of nowhere, I hear a police siren. Woo woo! My heart instantly drops. Every time I hear that sound, it does not sound like to protect and serve to me. I look up in my rearview mirror, and they light up my back window and summon me to pull over. And I did, knowing I hadn't done anything but I still know the police will try to find something. He walks up to my driver's side window, asks for my license and registration. Well, what's the problem, officer? Well, you ran a red light. It's bumper to bumper traffic right now. It's no way that I could have run a red light. He takes my driver's license and registration and goes back to his car. Whole time, I'm feeling confused, worried, Scared, knowing that I'm a black man in America, anytime the police pull me over, I always fear jail or death. He comes back up to the driver's side window. He tells me, your license, your license is suspended. I'm gonna need you to step out of the car. At that moment, I lose all power. At that moment, another police car pulls up He asked me to step out of the car, read me my rights, put both my hands behind me, and pushed me into the back of a police car. Here I am, almost a graduate from the University of Michigan, and I'm sitting in the back of a police car. Nothing else about me running a red light. He found something that he was looking for. And disbelief the entire time, because how is it that there's all this crime going on in the world, and I'm the one being arrested for a suspended license. Fact. Driving with a suspended license in the state of Michigan is a misdemeanor offense with a sentence up to 93 days in jail and up to $500. Damn. I arrive at the Dearborn Police Station And at the time, I'm faced with two police officers, the arresting officer and a booking officer. The booking officer hands me an orange jumpsuit and has me changed right there at front of the counter. I'm really being booked. He goes on to ask me, where do you work? I said, I work at John Glenn High School. The arresting officer radios it in. Do you have a Mr. Allen working there? I couldn't hear the response, but I could tell by his body language that he was embarrassed and he just slid out of the police station. The booking officer said, you work at John Glenn High School? Yes. He goes over to my belongings, grabs my cell phone, places it in my jumpsuit pocket, and tells me to get out of here the best way you can. From behind bars, I lose all my natural functions. I'm not tired. I'm not hungry. I'm stuck. First thing I do is take a picture of my feet, which no longer have shoes on them, just my black socks. Then a picture of my orange jumpsuit, and then of my face in a, in a face that I had never seen before, full of rage, confusion, frustration. Then I make my first call, one to one of my classmates. Hey, I can't make it to the symposium, just don't tell them that I'm in jail. My second call to my sister. Now, how you in jail with your cell phone? <laughs> my homeboy 
Man, I'm still at work. I can't even help. <laughs> My mother, which police station are you at? The ride home with my mother was silent. At that moment, I had gone from promising educator to prisoner to child. It was like a game of Monopoly and I had rolled the go to jail card and my mother had to bail me out. <laughs> the ride home was silent. I didn't say a thing, I just stared out of the window in embarrassment. The only thing she says to me was, your father would be so disappointed in you. And she was right. In that moment, I didn't even have a rebuttal for the situation. I couldn't even sleep that night. I'm up thinking about how do I get my car out of the impound? How do I get to work tomorrow? How do I explain it to my professors? And the next couple of days weren't any better. How do I pay off this ticket? How do I get my car out of the impound? How do I still drive around fearing getting arrested again, paying off driver responsibility, and, oh yeah, the most important thing, never, ever, 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 ever go back to Dearborn for anything. The following weeks, I'm in class, my Ed Theories class, and a little Chinese woman walks in, Martha, with this big personality and, and an opportunity of a lifetime. Would you all like to teach in China? Well, I knew what my experience was going to be here in the United States. <laughs> Instead of having just a master's degree on my resume, I now have a misdemeanor on my record. I know in education, anytime they ask the question, have you ever been arrested? Now I have to check yes. So yes, I'm listening, Martha. <laughs> the opportunity will require that I teach the entire summer in Beijing that I would miss my daughter's sixth birthday, that I had to get a rushed application for my passport and get a Chinese visa all in a matter of a month. The hardest part really was just deciding whether or not I was gonna miss my daughter's birthday. But this was an opportunity of a lifetime and I couldn't pass it up. So I rushed to get my application through with the passport, take a one day trip to Chicago to the Chinese consulate, all in order to pull this off in a month with hopes that this all works out and I spend the time with my daughter Gabrielle because daddy will be gone for a while. The flight to Beijing was gruesome. 14 hours on a flight. But the hospitality along Hainan, a top Chinese airline was impeccable. Warm towels before I ate each meal, perfectly proportioned meals, Stewardess in gray and red dresses tending to my every need. This was my first introduction to Chinese culture. My second introduction was the fanfare that comes with being a black man in China. As soon as I stepped off the airplane, I'm looking up at all these big neon signs that I can't read. I'm hearing words all around me that I can't comprehend. The only thing I do understand is that smiles are universal. We were a motley crew, me and my classmates. It was four of us. It was Samantha or Sam who had this big curly blonde hair. It was Devin who was somewhere between like Shaggy and Scooby-Doo. <laughs> and there was Marie, the sister from the D with a heart of gold. And there was me, G, the bald head brother with the beard, who when I arrived would hear a faint chance of O'Neal. O'Neal. Hold on, do these people think I'm Shaquille O'Neal? That dude is 7'1 and I'm 5'7 at best. Ain't no way they think I'm Shaq. We arrive at Beijing Royal School by personal coach a private school in China, red and gold statues outside, paintings all over the walls, impeccable, impeccable art and technology everywhere. Oh, and more fanfare. Every time I walked down the hallway, I was like a rock star, getting high fives and hugs, 
teacher, teacher, can I carry your things? Teacher, teacher, would you like to try this delicious treat? Teacher, what are we learning today? Versus being in Detroit and hearing, ah, Mr. Allen, bald headed. Head look like a milk dud. Hey, 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 you look like Luke Cage. And um, is you married? How old is you? My last name, Allen, the double L is hard to pronounce for native Chinese speakers. So they called me Mr. G or John Wei, meaning strong and powerful one. When I went there, I was under the impression that I was going to be teaching them language. Instead, they taught me something more valuable than language could ever comprehend. In a place like China, education is regarded at the highest esteem, and those who provide it are considered to be just as dignified. Opposed to being here in the United States where we deal with embezzlement, mismanagement of funds, teachers underpaid and disrespected. But in Beijing, I was a rock star. I was like a musical conductor, navigating language and culture and arts. Now, on the week during Beijing, we taught. But on the weekends, we took our show on the road. Every time we went somewhere, we were the main attraction, me and my Motley crew. Strangers would just hand me babies. Uh, elder, they would roll elders up to me in wheelchairs. I was in so many family pictures, I'm thinking I'm Chinese too. I'm bringing in all of this rich culture, all of these great experiences, but the whole time I'm still missing my daughter Gabrielle. And subconsciously, I started taking pictures of other fathers with their daughters and posting them on social media labeled father and daughter. Now, at the time, no one else was really significant in my life besides Gabrielle, which made this next part possible. Now, moving and getting around in China required that you did some navigating. I was always on subways, trains, or even a black cab, which was considered to be illegal. Now, the black cab drivers, they had this really slick way of like sliding over a false digit over their license plate, so it kept the police always guessing. Now, I know, I know, I'm riding dirty again, I know. <laughs> But listen, this is also the same place where I learned how to negotiate money and also use a little bit of Mandarin that I had picked up. Those shikwai waffle wing shingong you. Where do, where, how do I get, or how much does it cost to get to where I live? Shu shikwai, $40. Boo shong, no way. Our shikwai, $20. How da, how da, how da, how da. Okay, okay, okay. Now, getting back on my travels on the train, I meet this young lady who offered to show me the nightlife in China. This is far outside of my travel radius, but I met her at a rock and roll bar. Now, I'm invited, so I offered to buy drinks, Long Islands. I told her to take them slow. She didn't listen. So three drinks in, she's doing push-ups in the middle of the bar to prove to me, John Wei, that she could do anything. She pulls me out of the bar and we head down to Hutong, which is for US an alleyway. We approach this like brothel type place and in here the fanfare isn't like it was everywhere else. They weren't too excited to see a black man show up with an intoxicated Chinese woman looking for a room. No vacancies. She pulls me back out of the hutong. We go down to the WC. She comes back out in tears. What's wrong? Uh, 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 well, that was my boyfriend's bar and his club and his band. He's really upset with me for showing up with another guy, so get out of here the best way you can. What? 
at this point, I'm lost. And I mean lost, lost. I can't read one single sign. I don't know who to call. So I look up at God and I say, I know you know where I am. You have got to get me out of here. I waved down one of them black cabs, handed him my work ID badge. I didn't even negotiate this ride. I just had to get out of there. So was dating my thing in China? No. But impacting young lives across the world, absolutely. For them, I was the only black man that many of them will ever meet. I was carrying the weight of a culture in the places where black faces were generally only seen on TV and in movies. I returned back to the US with hand-stitched shoes for Gabrielle, a red dress and a matching hat to match. I also returned with a better sense of what it is that we need to advocate for in education. Number one, I made sure that we don't look at uniforms the same way when we police our children here. It was 40 grand a year to go to that school in Beijing and those kids wore hoodies and joggers. It also made me an advocate of study abroad programs because it ain't one single book that can ever capture all the nuances of living and being in another country. Before I returned to Beijing, I did graduate from the University of Michigan. I also returned with a contract for one year that stated I worked there for a year and Gabrielle got to come there as a student. But be it how circumstance works, our flight was delayed. Now, in that time, chance also opened itself to me again because I needed a letter of recommendation to return back to uphold my contract. I reach out to an old work colleague, Rachel. She's a powerhouse and a brick house of a woman. <laughs> Our relationship went from business to personal in a matter of six weeks. Now, she knew I was headed back to Beijing where my black was beautiful, where, rock, where teachers were treated like rock stars and where my daughter would have an opportunity of a lifetime. Fast forward, Gabrielle was treated like even more of a star than I was. I had to be her protector the entire time because they had never seen a little black girl walking the streets of Beijing. Rachel and I dated and talked on the phone every single day at a 12 hour time difference until she flew over to Beijing. We got married in a private ceremony on Valentine's Day in the middle of Chinese New Year, the whole town was painted red and there were fireworks everywhere. And for me, I returned with the job offer now to be able to teach in the United States. From that jail cell, I thought my whole life was over. I thought my career was over. But being able to say yes, right in the middle of my dilemma, made all of the difference. For me, China will forever have an impact in my life. Here, the things that I've grown to be, whether I'm known as G, Uncle G, Deacon G, Dean Allen, but in China was where I got my power back. In China, I grew into being Zhang Wei. On that trip, I got my full power back. Xie Xie, thank you. Gerard Allen, Gerard. Just say yes. 